Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of uh, Russlands Varane uh, and we're going to continue talking about my favorite theme uh, which is uh, l the languages of Russia. Uh, today I have uh, two guests with me uh, and we're going to talk about the uh, Chulim uh, language and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the first one is a uh, uh, is uh, was a linguist uh, and uh, and the teacher of the uh, uh, Chulim language, and the other one is a native uh, Chulim uh, who's a teach uh, uh, who's a teacher and uh, also works with uh, with preserving the Chulim uh, culture. And uh, both of the uh, of my guests. Uh, uh, live in the Siberian city of uh, Tomsk. And uh, uh, welcome, uh, uh, Valeria uh, Lemskova and uh, Olga Kastrova. Azanar. Azanar. This means hello uh, and thank you for uh, having us. This is uh, a pleasure and a privilege for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, and uh, to tell us about uh, for those who doesn't know anything about the Chulims, uh, tell us a little about uh, uh, who they are and their like and uh, and the, and their language. Чулымцы — это коренной малочисленный народ Сибири, который в основном проживает. В Томской области на северо-востоке и в Красноярском крае и Тюхтецком районе. По данным последней переписи 2010 года чулымцев осталось примерно 355 человек. И все они в основном ну, проживают в местах компактного расселения коренного народа. Uh, I'd like to add that the Chulim Turkic people, or the Chulims as they sometimes go in the literature and uh, in sources and, uh, and a lot of information, uh, they are probably the smallest Turkic people of Siberia, at least of South Siberia. So uh, 355 people, according to the old Russian national census of 2010, is an estimate number, of course, but even if we consider everyone who, who might be a Chulim Turk, uh, that would not exceed 500, I'm sure. And uh, as far as I'm aware, it seems like the minor, most, uh, the smallest Turkic speaking community in the South Siberian region of Russia. Mm. Uh, so they speak, uh, those who still speak, unfortunately, we do not have as many speakers left. Uh, they speak uh, a Turkic variety, their language is non-written, and uh, their uh, linguistic or dialectal diversity is great. It's uh, like uh, a separate dialect or variety in each and every village of their traditional uh, habitat, so to speak. Mm. Yes, so it's a, it's a, so how is the situation? It's uh, it's a dying language, uh, one can say. Да, да, то есть чулымский язык он внесен, как я, насколько мне известно, в Красную книгу и в список вымирающих языков ЮНЕСКО и ну и в Красную книгу России как исчезающий язык, потому что носители вот таких активных носителей, которые могут говорить и передавать язык наш чулымский, ну, около 10 человек, остальные, ну, можно сказать, чулымцы понимают на обиходном уровне. Но поколения примерно от 50 лет, то есть они еще ну, понимают свой чулымский язык, но ну, многие не говорят еще и в силу практики, то есть они не практикуют между собой, потому что все уже чулымцы владеют русским языком, и я так понимаю, просто из-за того, что нет необходимости, то есть уже больше на русском все говорят. 
Uh, still, uh, we, we've got a project we will probably describe a little later, uh, which is quite, an, uh, quite a striking experience, a thrilling one for me. Uh, we are teaching or learning uh, the Chulim Turkic language online uh, since November last year, I guess. And uh, I'm teaching it. I'm teaching the language of Teguldet, uh, where Olga originally comes from. And whenever I say something new, uh, sometimes those who come to learn their ethnic language, those Tulum Turks would say, oh, I've heard of that. Like, or, or what does this very phrase stand for? My grandfather used to say that. Or maybe like, I, I remember this or that word or phrase. And sometimes they can even reproduce a dialogue which is really great. And uh, saying that the language is nearly extinct as the ethnologue classification puts it, or some other uh, like uh, linguistic, um, I don't know, estimates. It's, it's uh, surely uh, probably so, but uh, when, when it comes uh, to language and culture, the way they live and survive, uh, one can never tell 100% this language is dying, is disappearing, or has even become extinct, uh, unless they have really asked every single person. So, uh, so far, uh, the Chulim Turkic, um, I cannot say story, or maybe the state of the art, is uh, surely not uh, as uh, positive as uh, we hope it could be. But at the same time, uh, as, I mean, it's not that everything has been lost. Uh, we still have chance, uh, I could say that. Yes, but uh, this is a, a question uh, for Olga. Uh, f um, the like uh, like an, a native uh, a Chulim yourself. Like, uh, w what is your experience with the uh, with the uh, Chulim uh, language? Do you speak it? Каков ваш опыт чулымского языка? Говорите ли вы на нем? А, в настоящее время мы активно у нас проходит обучение, но мой уровень еще, я не могу сказать хороший, потому что мы только си, а, сейчас начинаем вспоминать, изучать, говорить между собой. А, но только то, можно сказать, что есть понимание отдельных слов, какие-то родители какие-то говорили, ну, говорят какие но ну, это просто какие-то обрыв не то что обрывки отдельные слова простые предложения но опыта ну, такого свободного говорения так, э, свободного владения пока еще нет но мы над этим работаем в настоящее время and, uh, this, and this goes for uh, Valeria uh, because as I understand it you yourself are an ethnic Russian like uh, uh, what uh, made you want to study and learn uh, the Chulim language? Uh, I originally come from Kyrgyzstan, a, uh, an ex-Soviet country of Central Asia, uh, and uh, I learned Kyrgyz, a Turkic language itself, from kindergarten. Unfortunately, as every single Soviet person, I could never speak it because we had very bad, bad methods of teaching or uh, like the uh, culture of use was very different. If I'm ethnic Russian, no one would speak Kyrgyz to me, like among the Kyrgyz people in the city. But anyway, when I was a teen, I enrolled in a Turkish school uh, with uh, teachers from Turkey and had no chance but to start speaking Turkish. So after I graduated from high school, I came to Tomsk of Siberia, where my mother originally came from, and enrolled in my translation and interpretation studies. Um, my major and minor were English and German, translation and interpretation. Still, uh, by the end of my education, I found out that there was a department of Siberian languages at the Pedagogical University, and uh, they really needed badly someone to keep on studying the Chulim Turkic language. So before me, uh, no one had, had uh, taken care of it for like 30 years, although Andreas Durzon uh, was uh, the um, uh, forefather of this department and started uh, researching the language and then his, uh, some of his, uh, let's say, disciples did it. Uh, there was, there were, there had been no studies from like uh, late 1970s up until 200, uh, 2005 when I enrolled into my uh, postgrad program. 
So that's basically like a happenstance uh, why I started to uh, study the language to do research. And I, at that point, I had never thought I would like uh, uh, stay with the language for so long. And it's been like 16 years now that I've been uh, doing research and uh, studying this very language and culture. <laughs> Yeah, and the viewers, I understand that you also uh, teach n uh, native uh, Chulims their own language too. That is another uh, coincidental chance, <laughs> <laughs> coincidence, chance, happenstance, call it whatever. Like uh, uh, less than a year ago, I got a call from the Tegledet library saying, we'd like to apply for this type of a culture project about Chulim uh, language and culture revitalization. Would you like to join us to teach us some Chulim Turkic? And uh, we invited people like Olga and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, people from uh, the village of Tegeldet, the regional center uh, where most Chulim Turks live. And um, I had never thought like, you know, I would ever teach uh, the language. But again, thanks to modern technology, uh, we're doing it online and some people from remote villages also join us, which is really great. Uh, we've got a big, big community. So some colleagues actually uh, connect from Moscow and we also had some other places. Uh, so uh, and what is also good, all the classes are being recorded. All the materials are being stored at the uh, project web page and anyone can actually see whatever we have. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I would guess that uh, mo uh, only in Russian. If there's some uh, listeners that uh, have a have an interest, it's they have to learn the Russian first. That's an interesting question. Because <laughs> Я считаю, что у нас достаточно материала для изучения чулымского языка, но он в основном весь на русском языке. То есть можно зайти на информационные источники, но там ну, все будет на русском языке. И только через таким образом можно овладеть ну, чулымским языком, то есть начального уровня. У нас и по проекту, который проходит в Тигульдецком районе, называется Музей Центр Возрождения Чулымской Культуры. На их сайте библиотеки выложены все уроки, которые проходят сейчас у нас в онлайн формате. Уже порядка 11 уроков. И, но, конечно же, они все то есть на русском языке. И для того, чтобы туда зайти, нужно знать русский язык. Still, with uh, modern technology and automated translation, it's not a big deal, you know, to see the list of words or phrases or sentences and translate the Russian parts into English or whatever language and try to master things. So we hope we will be you know, like enhancing or expanding the project. And uh, we've been talking with linguists about uh, translating such language platforms as the LinguoDoc where some of the Cholim uh, dictionaries uh, are stored with sound uh, and with a lot of materials. So we're talking about making an automated or half automated translation of the materials that are in Russian into English so mm. that our colleagues from abroad actually have better access to that. Mm. So hopefully uh, we're not giving up. We're, we're just going to uh, enhance things. Yeah, but uh, yeah. But uh, it's interesting because I I got to know about the Chulim language thanks to a documentary called uh, The Language. It's a documentary where uh, two uh, American uh, linguists uh, 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 goes around the world or uh, specific or like uh, studying for or like going out in the field to uh, uh, study the four uh, dying languages all around the world not to, and one of these languages was the Chulim uh, language and uh, it's a really great documentary I really recommend it and I don't know if you have watched it but uh, what uh, what did change after that uh, uh, after that film came out in 2008 uh, did the film 
in some way help with the preservation of the language and culture? No. Знаете, я считаю, что любое, ну, любой интерес а, как этнографов, лингвистов, документа, ну, кто снимает документальные фильмы, они ну, то есть привлекают внимание и самих чулынцев к их языку и культуре, ну и, конечно же, внимание ну, мировой, мировой общественности. А, сама я этот фильм смотрела только небольшими фрагментами, и так как он не переведен на русский язык, то, конечно же, мне не совсем было понятно, что там происходит, когда говорят на английском языке. И ну, в любом случае это только положительно сказывается для привлечения внимания. И я считаю это очень хорошо. Yeah, uh, they also uh, tell a story uh, of Vasily Mikhailovich Gabov, or Vasya, as they call him in the movie, in the documentary, who was originally like their driver, but then driving around and asking people the Chulim Turks, like, uh, do you speak Chulim? They, they asked in Russian. People had not understood anything. They did not understand what this Chulim was because their uh, ethnic like identification used to be either Tatars, like uh, the Melets Tatars or Tutal Tatars, or uh, Hakas, the uh, Chul maybe Chulim Hakas, but still usually some uh, Hakas type of um, like uh, community. And uh, when David uh, asked a lady, do you speak Chulim? And then Vasily Mikhailovich would like, you know, pop up a pop or like uh, he would uh, cut the word and say, uh, something like, do you speak your own language, say something, and uh, they discovered that he was a speaker. And uh, uh, first of all, that's how we all started to work with him as a language consultant, so this was the greatest positive feedback of the movie. And the second thing was, it was a very, very big event for the community, you know, that uh, after such hard uh, times of the 1990s, the beginning of the 2000s, uh, people had a, a kind of difficulty in their lives. And then here, like a bunch of Americans with all that equipment, like cameras and, uh, uh, I don't know, audio um, recorders come, and they're kind of looking for something. And it was uh, like a revelation to the community that they were not just looking for uh, people or places, they were looking for the language. And uh, they really understood how important that was and uh, kind of started to be a little bit more open about it. But uh, the uh, bad thing, or maybe not the bad thing, the uh, little bit negative aspect is that uh, this uh, documentary was not really shown uh, like on the Russian TV. Uh, and it cannot be shown um, like by individuals because there is a copyright, uh, a copyright issue. And uh, I was told by Greg Anderson, one of the linguists, mm. that he had to buy a copy himself and pay money to actually have it. You know, mm. so uh, this is a little bit. If if that is about the humanitarian mission, so to speak, of the movie, then we had better show it uh, at least on regional TV. Mm. And then, uh, but if we show it on channel one of Russia, for example, uh, this will be known from uh, the far east uh, to, uh, to, to the far west, to the uh, United States, Canada, and other countries. Uh, probably uh, this may happen one day, but still, um, for sure, uh, the film had a, a good impact on, on everyone. And uh, I understand uh, you mentioned uh, you, yourself right now, you're not the only one who would find out about the Chulim Turks uh, from that movie, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's true. Like, and that's, uh, yeah, and again, it's a movie that I truly recommend. And of course, there's, it's available on the, on the of course, I think I can provide the, a link in the description below, because uh, I think it's available uh, on online, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, so but yeah, it's it's a very interesting film, and I truly recommend it once again. By, um, by the way, I can just add one more stuff. Cutting your word, excuse me for that. Yeah. But 
the real reason, the first time uh, Greg and David, and uh, I was told so by them, uh, came to the Chulim community was actually to shoot the film. They had not had any project uh, to support the language documentation, but uh, those um, people just wanted to shoot a film about the dying languages and, and their study. And the really first time they came to Tegeldad, to Tomsk, was because some uh, documentary movie makers wanted to make a film. So, and that's how the documentation process really boosted and uh, all of the modern like principal type of language documentation was possible with audio and video and uh, comprehensive documentation with the Chulin language. So uh, this really, I mean, yeah, mm. was uh, positive from all aspects. Yeah. Okay, but uh, we can talk about a little about the language now. Um, uh, do you have some interesting fact? I know I just got received the word that you Olga have to go, so uh, I think we're gonna. Uh, uh, it was nice uh, having you on, and uh, then uh, we uh, then me and uh, uh, Valera is gonna continue to talk about the the language itself. Да. Спасибо большое за приглашение на ваше интервью. Очень интересные вопросы. И я думаю, что не, э, наше, возможно, общение не закончится. Мы вас приглашаем на наши уроки изучения чулымского языка. И э, было очень приятно с вами общаться. И я надеюсь, что как можно больше людей узнают еще о, о чулымцах, о чулымском языке, о таком, о, можно сказать, малочислен... очень малочисленном народе, который живет в России, в Сибири, в Томской области и Красноярском крае. Mm -hmm. Спасибо большое. Yes, it's uh, very pleasant. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay, but okay. So now we're gonna talk about the language is, itself, and uh, like, uh, do you have some interesting uh, facts about the language? Uh, where should I begin? You uh, think about the Chulim Turkic language as one of the Turkic languages, and uh, um, on the whole, it's kind of the same if you speak about any of them. So on the one hand, it's uh, as similar to all the other Turkic languages as any other. But on the other hand, uh, there are so many interesting and individual features that uh, do not look like anything else. Like, for example, uh, when there is um, uh, the possessive suffix of the third person singular and the words that have uh, what, that whose uh, how should I say that, whose uh, final vowel of the stem is a, ah, if uh, they, those languages, and no, those words get a possessive suffix, this very last a ah will turn into something else, and it will turn into o ah in Pasechnoya uh, village, and it will turn into e eh, uh, in the Tegoldet area. And then all the other vowel harmony of the following suffixes will be according to this changed sound. So, for example, um, boy or son is uh, pala in Chulim. And if it is his son, it's going to be palozu in one dialect and palese in the other. Hmm. So this is quite striking. And we have not really discovered the reasons for that. And what is also interesting is uh, things like that happen with the verb, uh, like uh, par, and then there are a lot of uh, present tense forms with the historic tur, which is like uh, tur means to stand and par means to go. But uh, instead of saying parade, as it is reconstructed, uh, one dialect will say parodu and the other will say parede. So a similar process is the one I mentioned before, only in the verb system. Uh, this is quite striking. Still, uh, lexically, there are many features that are not like anything else. And for example, the word bear, like the, the animal bear, uh, which is like in all the Turkic world, either ayu, ayu, ayur, 
it's going to be in the middle Tulum dialect uh, the, of Pasich Noye and Teguldet, it's going to be Mohalak, which seems to be like a grammaticized form of some uh, phrase or, or verb. And uh, the Marek Stachowski of Poland um, has written some, uh, well, hypotheses about etymology of the uh, etymologies of this uh, word. But uh, I, I cannot now guarantee and say, uh, well, first, I cannot remember what they are. <laughs> but second uh, is exactly whether uh, there could be any other options as well. Still, this very word in the sense of the bear as the animal only exists in the Chulun Turkic dialects. So this is quite striking. And the bear as an animal is one of the uh, feel like quite common words or concepts in, in all the Turkic speaking world. So why would that be so in the Chulim community? I cannot tell now. <laughs> That's quite interesting. But uh, in what other way does, uh, uh, does the Chulim language uh, uh, differ from the other Turkic languages? Yes and no, as I already said. So uh, all the Turkic languages are similar in their basic vocabulary, in their cognates, and their words. Like it's going to be, if it's one, it's going to be this, almost the same everywhere. Pir, bir, uh, maybe pur, bur, but uh, kind of uh, going back to the same root, to the same um, stem. If it is I myself, it's going to be ban, men. But, you know, bu, ma, pu, bu interchange is something quite, quite common in the Turkic world. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you look at the grammar system, at the, at the way things are revealed on the surface. Uh, every single, not only language, but every dialect, every village is sort of unique. And uh, the way they display themselves, it's uh, going to be so unpredictable. Like I mentioned, uh, uh, the Korean uh, scholars uh, came and worked with Vasily Mikhailovich and could not record some of the word forms in the paradigm. And then they kind of wrote, uh, we expect, or it is expected, uh, the form is going to be this and that. And my criticism would go, if you had like uh, read uh, Dulzon's works, or if you had asked better, uh, you would never get this form. It would be this and that, you know. Mm. So, and uh, this online teaching project really helps us because we can, uh, I, we appreciate, we can still speak uh, to the speakers, we can ask them. And uh, so many new things have come up, have popped up, something I could never expect. Mm. So, uh, especially with the non-spoke, um, excuse me, with the non-written language, with uh, the language um, that lacks literary norm, uh, this uh, degree of diversity, this degree of uniqueness is really uh, kind of highest, mm. the highest possible. Yeah. So. So we can say that there are uh, that there are many uh, uh, many languages, not just one uh, Chulim uh, language. Or is it uh, kind of a part of a dialectal continuum continuum with other uh, Turkic languages? Yeah. Well, again, uh, we also mentioned um, uh, what has been mentioned before is like this uh, Germanic world, right? where the dialectal difference is so big, so great, which uh, is never re reflected in the literary norm, in the standard. So something you write in your native Norwegian language is nothing that is spoken in every part of Norway, right? Mm. And uh, similarly to that, uh, in Siberia, so the altai Sayan region is considered to be the uh, proto-land of the Turkic world, of the Turkic languages and peoples, uh, so the more ancient the place is, the greater diversity there will be. It's kind of similar, by the way, to the languages of Dagestan or the Caucasus of Russia. So uh, practically you have a different variety and actually the English word variety is really great. It's like a compromise. It's not a dialect, it's not a language, it's not a sub-dialect, it's just really some unique feature, uh, variety. Uh, in uh, Russian, there is the word Narichi, which uh, Wilhelm uh, Radlov used a lot. Uh, and to tell, well, frankly speaking, everybody understands uh, their own concept of what it is. 
So still uh, coming back to the English variety, it's a good word uh, showing that uh, each is like a separate language with its own features and uh, traditions. And practically speaking, every village had their own variety. Uh, here we call, we think it's rather like a cluster, a dialectal cluster or a variational cluster. Yes, I agree to your definition of the language continuum and um, talking uh, of the Chulim, it's not only the Chulim, we also have other languages like the Hakas, Shor, and Teleut, and uh, Tatar dialects of the Siberian Tatars. So, um, to tell the truth, it's like a very, very long story, and uh, I could talk for hours about that. <laughs> yes, no, that's, uh, me too, but uh, I don't know about the audience, but uh, yeah, and uh, but it's also interesting because in the the documentary film, it, the linguist, uh, there was a, uh, they only had one uh, book to work with, like one, uh, 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 one old book to work with about the the Chulim language. But it seems like it the uh, the Chulim language had kind of gotten a revival in sense of uh, written material. So tell us uh, how much material are there. Uh, both about the the Chulim language um, and uh, 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 like literature, like uh, fiction literature in the Chulim in te and other texts in the Chulim language. So um, two years ago, uh, we were able to publish uh, the translation of the Gospel of Mark into the Chulim language, which actually happens to be the first and the only book uh, which was really published for the Chulim Turkic people in the Chulim Turkic modern language. But uh, there have been studies uh, of the language for decades and uh, linguists have collected quite a lot of material and I've been privileged to work, uh, to have worked with three variants of the language, so three varieties. Uh, if I count my corpus of, of the language, it's huge. Uh, I kind of tried to count how many hours I've got. I've got like almost uh, eight or probably now 90 hours of video materials and uh, uh, almost 200, uh, 200 uh, hours of audio materials of the language. Uh, so, um, if we are able to really process all that and how to um, annotate and write down and prepare. It's going to be really great uh, material. But so far, we've got this online teaching project, and whatever we prepare, everything that the speaker helped us with, uh, we try to actually annotate, uh, put down, and uh, put it online uh, on the website of the project so that, uh, like anyone who wants, um, gets an access to that. Plus, uh, I already have uh, um, the first volume of the book, uh, which is about the second uh, village, the Pasichna village, uh, prepared with the speaker, with the main consultant from there. So it's already in the publishing house, waiting for the last revision from me. And uh, it's going to be a dictionary with uh, some grammar samples. The second volume, which I'm also finishing now, is going to be a collection of texts with annotation. And these two volumes like have a, um, uh, like a, um, I don't know, multiple purpose. So it is both, they are both for the community and uh, for the linguists and probably ethnographers too. So uh, we are trying to make it like, you know, universal. <laughs> or uh, versatile, I'm not sure how to better call it, because uh, uh, when we make something just for the community, like we can lose some of the things uh, we've talked about uh, with you, so some linguistic features, some um, attention to that. If we make it for the linguists, it's going to be boring for the community, and no one is going to use that. So um, hopefully we'll have uh, quite a bunch of materials, and the online teaching project at the end of it, we really hope we can make like a manual uh, of this uh, Tegeldet variety for people, for anyone to study it, be it linguists or people from abroad or just the Chulim Turkic um, um, like uh, community members. Yeah, let's hope so. It, it seems like you, you all have done a great job, and especially a lot of 
things have happened since the documentary. So, yeah. That's for sure. And uh, one of the good things is that the people are very positive about it. So they really try to help. And uh, the youngsters, uh, people like Olga, and well, not really youngsters, but uh, people in their 30s actually develop a better interest in their history of the community and their ethnic origin and their like traditional language and culture. And they're trying to be really more active in that. Yeah. And again, uh, this very initiative of uh, online teaching came not from me. I, I had just been this linguist who would do documentation, go to every possible uh, like you know field work uh, trip or invite speakers uh, to work with me. Uh, but they, as a community, decided to apply for that project to get some minor support. And uh, they invited me just to give them online teaching. Uh, rather than, you know, me as a linguist uh, going to them and uh, offering them something they were not interested in, interested in. So I, I really am privileged and I'm thankful that uh, it has happened this way. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, there is still chance for Chulim Turkic, although uh, the ethnologue classifies it's nearly extinct. Uh, one never knows. No. So with Lower Chulim dialect, uh, the last speaker was not known for like 20 years that he still spoke the language and then he found us, he found one of our late professors and she uh, took me with her and I was able to actually work with him and uh, the audio recordings of, the, of his variety that are available now are the only ones that uh, I made, unfortunately no other audio recordings. So. Uh, I'm also very eager to uh, make some kind of, I don't know, like a collection or um, uh, like a manual. So what is also great is the book that we're making, everything has been voiced. It's not just a written text. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're also going to put uh, that online, but uh, there are so many technical difficulties one could never imagine. <laughs> And uh, unless you start doing it, you think, oh, it's so easy, you know, it will take some time. But when you start cutting uh, the words and phrases and putting them together with the uh, written, or there are like difficulties about how to really write the language. Uh, there are no sounds in the Russian alphabet. Well, there are many things. Uh, again, I could talk about yeah, yeah. that. But uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, me too. But I think we have to uh end end it all now and uh, say that uh, uh it was really nice having you here and uh, and i hope a lot of people get inspired to check out the uh the chulim language i will uh, provide i will uh play some links in the description below and uh yeah thank you for your interest again it was quite unexpected for me mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, but uh, I also appreciate that uh, people from far away, mm. and I'm sure you also in Norway can be considered that you are from very far away and mm. we are in Siberia, we're far away mm. from many places. So we actually can get connected and find mutual interests and topics to discuss. And uh, it's really great that you're trying to cover like all the uh, variety the Russian Federation has and mm. thank you for your interest mm. and again the reason like uh, uh, you're doing it in both languages mm. in Russian and English it's really great that uh, so that more people can yeah. you know, watch it yeah and, right. uh, yeah but that reason is maybe because I'm too lazy to make subtitles and I don't have the money for voiceovers <laughs> but uh, well, I think I it's think interesting to do both Russian anyway so <laughs> uh, it's really great that, you know, like there are specialists like Edward Vida, for example, who mm. can do both uh, some other specialists and uh, we, we really uh, love uh, what we're doing. We love the people, the languages and we're very, very happy to talk about that. And uh, I, I just wish uh, you to uh, not lose interest <laughs> in your field in this field and we are open for cooperation and uh, uh, one can either find contacts online or write uh, either you or under the video you're, you're going to post and uh, we are very happy to share uh, what we've done. 
And as it was also mentioned, uh, we are trying to give uh, to pay to, to do a payback to the community. Mm. And what's really pr precious for us is that the community, people like Olga and other, uh, they use things that the ethnographers and linguists of the past and present have collected, have gathered, and now they're using it both to sew their national costumes, you know, to play, to do some sketches for some celebration of the day of the mother tongue. And uh, we're really happy that it's not just uh, some uh, boring academic uh, research we're doing in, in our offices, but really working with the people and uh, trying to do something about the languages that are so minor and so interesting. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yes. thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, how do you say goodbye in Chulim? Uh, well, one of the variants that were given us, <laughs> that's Chakshiz and Polish or Chakshiz and Kalish. So please stay with kindness, so to speak, or um, grace be with you, probably like that. Can you repeat so, it? Polish. What is it? Can you repeat it? Chakshiz and Kalish. Chakshiz and Kalish. Almost there, right? Almost. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Bye. Bye. Some colors. <laughs> Some colors. <laughs>